Oh, Tutu, tell me where the people going today. Oh, Tutu, tell me where the people going today. They're going down Maku, I'll bring Hokupu and pray. They're going down Maku, I'll bring Hokupu and pray. Oh, Tutu, please, can you tell me how to go? Oh, Tutu, please, can you tell me how to go? Take my hand and follow, this road is long and slow. Take my hand and follow, this road is long and slow. Tutu, when I get there, oh, what gifts shall I bring? Tutu, when I get there, oh, what gifts shall I bring? Come with aloha aina and the song to sing. Come with aloha aina and the song to sing. Oh, Tutu, wake up, they're burning her tonight. Oh, Tutu, wake up, they're burning her tonight. Don't call everybody, tell them we must fight. Don't call everybody and tell them we must fight. Can you show us the bono things to do? In we kavai ava ava and it will come to you. In we kavai ava ava and it will come to you. Oh Makua, tell us how to heal your pain. Oh Makua, tell us how to heal your pain. Look for the answer in the ulal and the rain. Find the answer in the hula land of rain. Eh ho, mau makua, soon you will be free. Eh ho, mau makua, soon you will be free. Aina pula pula from the mountains to the sea. Aina lana kila from the mountains to the sea. Aina ika pono from the mountains to the sea. I Ikea from the mountains to the sea. If you folks don't know, uh, this is Uncle Sparky Rodriguez. I grew up watching Uncle Sparky on Lelo TV. I grew up watching Uncle Sparky with his beautiful wife, Akinanda, protecting my poor man. With Dr. Vince Dodge. And, you know, for some reason, when I was growing up, I used to follow all these people. Uncle Sparky, Uncle Walter, Auntie Haunani, Auntie Mililani was my, she was my attorney when I was 15 years old. <laughs> and she got, and you know, she got me off because if not, I would have graduated and cool off. <laughs> but um, I was following all these people. And just, just to know to have a relationship with one of our own. Love you, Uncle Spucky. So without no further ado, Pai Pai Lima, Yao Ko, for Uncle Spucky Rodriguez. Thank you. Wait this is the first time I did on uh, PowerPoint, so um, normally it would be presented, but you can come look at them later. So I'm going to be talking off with uh, my notes on the computer, which is photos and little things in there. But let me start, I want to start out with two definitions. Uh, one was given to me by Kuhuna Sam Lono. Uh, after I got back from Vietnam, my cousin became a Hamana with him. And I had a chance to sit with them and listen. I was more of the fly on the wall kind of guy. And one of the things that he shared to the group of his hamana was that you can do anything you like. And we all said, hey, right on. Back then, being really young, back from Vietnam, booze, drugs, women, that was the thing. So, but he ended up 
putting the phrase at the end, which really bummed us out, he said, you can do anything you want, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. Bummers. And then years later, um, Sam Ka'ai, she shared an old definition of Ohana. I always had a problem with Ohana because it separated me from others. And you had people that were ali'i, nui, whatever, and you had all the, the slave laborers. I was done, yeah. My favorite is the Lepo Popolo. That's my color, that's my smell, that's what I like, that's what I relate most to. Um, so, anyway, Ohana, I always had problems, but Sam Ka'ai shared the old definition of the word Ohaha, or family, which was the word Aina. All living things was Aina. All things was Aina. And at that point, Uamau Ke'e'a Aina took on a whole new meaning. The things we talk about today was Aina, but we're not separated, we connect it. So I'm gonna be talking about Makua, and that definition of what family is and what life is, is around the word Aina, where everything is included. The rocks, the bugs, the plants, the dirt, the air, the soil, everything. So that made it easier for me to do the battles that we had to do. Um, and I'm gonna start off with the tour of Wainai first. And this is a story of my, my grandson who was here earlier, but he left so I can talk about him. Uh, my wife who passed away a couple years ago, she ended up taking him on a trip, uh, and she said, oh, look boy, you see the trees over there? Or actually, no, you see that jungle? It's really, really impressive. And he says, Puna, I cannot see him because the trees stay in the way. And that's pretty much how our entire coast, maybe our entire world is today. So, if you do a tour of Wainai, I was going to start at Barbara's Point, Kalailua. But uh, we also talked about Wainai, the big mullet. The hatchery was Pearl Harbor. And when we killed Pearl Harbor, all the anai that used to come around and go around the island never started their journey because they're not there. I have never seen why anai, the big anai here on the coast. And I did a lot of diving in my youth on this side. So if you can imagine, that was one starting point. But on the west side, you had Barber's Point. It's I-1, the high industrial area. So all the contamination that comes to Oahu it basically goes there. Deep Draft Harbor. When they ended up dr uh, dredging that, we had a high level of cigatera poisoning on the coast yeah. from the fish. You got a hotel now. That used to be deep sinkholes that uh, my uncle used to do a lot of diving and he would catch turtles and other fish, put them into the, the saltwater pond for later. Um, now you got a gated community there. Now you cannot go to the beach at a certain time. You can, once the parking stall filled, you cannot. Um, as you're coming past that, you got the solid waste dump. All the solid waste of Oahu end up going in Waimanalo Gulch. It is now Waimanalo Mauna. Huge. Um, going past that is Kahi Point. We provide a lot of the power that feeds all of Oahu. At one point, it had the high sulfur fuel that generated the, gener uh, the electricity. And every time we had Kona wind, that would flow over into Nanakuli, which was the highest population of Hawaiians. My wife's auntie lived there. And every time they had Kona wind, she had to close the house because she has asthma. Just past that, you got the construction waste at PVT. That is also another Nanakuli Mauna coming up. All of the construction waste is taken there. They're recycling it, so they're doing a good job. It's not where it's just really bad, but this is why not. I mean, again, all of the stuff is coming here, and the burden is on our community. As you go past that, you got Lulule Magazine, 
and the RF communication to tall towers. That's a million watts of radio frequency radiation. So it has a big cell phone that we're exposed to. And there's certain places in Waianae where that low frequency beam, if you drive your car through it, your radio goes. Yeah. And it's always the same space, so you can see how that beam is going through there. There was a place in Maili that had a high incidence of cancer. There was a cancer cluster where the children there had childhood leukemia, all of them passed. And they said, oh no, no, cannot be related. Around the same time, they moved all the personnel from uh, Lulule out. They don't live there anymore. They go where? They go out. So they don't stay there anymore. Um, the magazine also, in some of the signs, when I went through, uh, the signs have, you cannot enter without full, I don't know, what, what, what space suit. The hazmat suit. And I'm thinking, what's inside of there? So one day I asked the Navy guy, is there an evacuation plan if something happened? Oh, no, no, nothing can happen. Yeah, well, how are you gonna warn us if something does happen? Oh, we don't have a plan in place. So my sarcasm was saying, so you're just going to get 50,000 body bags for the people living on the coast. And that's your solution. So again, this is some of the things that I'm looking at as we go through Wainai. Uh, you're going down further in Lulule where I live. I'm a downwinder of all the activity going on in Scofield. The open burn, open detonation, when they go ahead and train, all of the trade winds bring that stuff over and blows right in my window. When they burn, all of that stuff, just like when they used to burn sugar cane, all of the little leaves would be all over the ground, the ground would be black. So as wine I, I mean, we haven't even got past Lulu Lei yet. So this is what we're exposed to, the military's presence, the industrial presence, the commercialism that's going on here. Another part is that Waianae has more cable landings than anywhere else on the island. Starting from just outside Nanakuli, they got the, let's see, that uh, trend, the cable station, just as you go from Kahe Point to Nanakuli, right on the hump. Yeah, Verizon. Verizon? Yeah, so that's their Pacific Cable. Pokai, uh, Makaha, Makua, Kiabaula. All of these places have landing. And we paid for the traffic jam every time they're in trench to put the cable. What do we get back? Nothing. Uh, okay, munition transportation. Every time they transfer munitions, there is a 1,200 meter blast zone around each one of those vehicles. If there's an accident, that's the kill radius. Goes past most of the housing, all of the schools, all of the businesses on our coast. Uh, Makua. They have been, military has been using that from the late 20s. And the lease goes to 2029. So I'm gonna, as I go through the, the slides, I'll explain to you a little more about the lease and how it impacted. So anyway, from when they started 2029 to, uh, no, from 1929 to 2029. Is that right? Yeah, anyway, 100 years for one dollar. Not a dollar a year even, this is more insulting. It's a penny a year and on the lease, it says they don't have to clean it up. All they got to do is give it an appraisal, write a check, and walk away. When I went to Puerto Rico, they had the Navy there. And what happened is that they used the place for bombing practice, all kinds of stuff. And when they were done, they turned it over to Fish and Wildlife. And this is one of the things they got planned for Makua, that you could do for Pocolo, or any other of the other training area. Turn it over to another federal agency that will be responsible for it but the fence will say, stay out. Yeah. And their solution for pollution is dilution. So let the bombs degrade into the ground and let the chemicals and poison just uh, resolve itself naturally, going to the plants, going to the animals, going to the environment, the water and stuff. 
so this becomes part of the uh, things that we are exposed to but may not be aware of. The other part is uh, Kaena Point. They have all the tracking stations, the uh, golf balls on top. I seen a aerial, uh, the, an air map, this is for pilots. And it said stay away, 1500 meters minimum, stay away from that. Sterilization possible. So, does that stuff hit the ground? I mean, you know, I, I don't know how this radar band travels straight line or does it go wide? Does it go down to the beach so every time you go there you get a little sterilized? I don't know. But this is what we become blind to and become normal. And that's a sad part of what we, what's been going on. So like I said, Sigatera, solid waste, uh, our near shore contamination as well as the air contamination from all of the military's activities and their inability to find money to clean up, but they find plenty of money to build up. They can find money for bullets, bombs, and rockets, but they have no idea what it's gonna to take to clean up the land that they polluted. Uh, one of the scary part is that in, in Makua, the first bullet, lead bullet that was shot there is still there degrading into the soil. Same with the first unexploded ordinance. And all the unexploded ordinances that have been used and not cleaned up is still there degrading. Um, within the, the poisons that's within that, military uh, toxins, some of the stuff changes us um, genetically. It'll change our DNA. And we're constantly exposed to this. So as downwinders from Schofield, impacted by the, the low frequency and high frequency radar and communication systems, the uh, bombing that goes on and all of the stuff that's there, we are exposed to. It also ch affects our reproductive system. So the kids that are playing, those children that are of reproductive age, what are we gonna look like in 100 years? Will we be producing uh, jello babies? It's happened in the Philippines. When the military left the Philippines, they left all the Opala there, and they left. And the ambassador said, well, they never negotiate that, so we're not cleaning them, we're leaving. They were not smart enough to make sure it was done. In Germany, the Germans made sure they cleaned it up to pre-use condition. Our hope with Malama Makua is that we'll be able to one day return Makua to a culture and traditional use, get the forest, the dryland forest back, get the streams to flow, and hopefully one day we can make it where it provides food and cultural training for the next generations. That's not gonna happen in my lifetime. Seven generations maybe. Maybe not even that. Because they're still pulling bombs out of Germany and France and Great Britain. They're still finding unexploded stuff. Um, as you also know, they were also cleaning, they're doing research on uh, bombs that was dumped in the near shore on the reef, but they also took it way out and dumped a whole bunch of stuff. All of the munitions from World War II was dumped in our waters. So if you're doing bottom fishing and that stuff is now getting into the food site uh, system, what does that mean? Is it killing them? Is it making them deformed? Is it changing their genetics? We don't know. I, all I got now is questions at this point, because I'm almost done with the tour of Y9. Uh, and you guys are also welcome to take a look, you know, thumb through this. Um, so for me, my grandmother lived on uh, Upena Street in Makaha. So although I grew up in Kololo, we spent a lot of time on this side. And Makua was always a thing that called and when I got married with Le uh, Leandra and I, that was also a place that called us. And it was a place that we used as a healing for our relationship, because there was a time that wasn't so good. During that time, we had a chance to uh, check out the, uh, the traditional ways of healing. And ask the question, how do we solve our problems? And we have to listen. And this is where that spirituality comes in. And Makua would talk to us. 
for her. She had her answers, I had mine. And we started working on how we were gonna do that. During the same time, the Army was saying is that for the people that were homeless, because that's one of the groups that we came out of, um, no, no, you gotta be healed, you gotta be cured, and you gotta be housed, but not here. You can go any place, but you cannot stay here. You gotta be gone. So during that time, it was a choice, do I get arrested for uh, standing up for what was right? We were looking for a long-term solution, solution to homelessness. They were not interested in that. They're still not interested in that. But it was more than that, it was about access to the Aina to the point where we could heal and find our place and see how we fit, but also how we could listen and learn. We gained a lot of understanding by doing that. Um, give you an idea of the history of Makua. Uh, there was an Ali'i born 35 generations before Kamehameha I. He was born in Ohikilolo, which is this next Akua, right next to us. This is Keao, the other one is Ohikilolo. Makua, the cave, was not the way it looks today. That went all the way to the ocean. They blew that up to put in a railroad. Um, so with that, in Makua, we have petroglyphs, we've got cultural sites, we've got endangered species. And this has all been abused by the military. And part of it is all of our fault because we look at it, well, it's all green. All alien species. All of these things have colonized all of the coasts. We don't see the ahu that would mark each of the ahu pua'a. Our streams don't flow. We don't see the springs. I remember going to Wainai Valley, halfway down the valley, uh, my brother-in-law's uncle lived there, and he had wet and taro growing because it was fed by a spring. Gone. It's not there. They got houses in that area right now. In Makua, some of the things, the endangered species, there was uh, four haha, which is an endangered species. Um, up on the ridge, it's the center ridge. You look at Makua uh, and it's almost like a McDonald's. The center ridge is where the jets would come in and dump all of their remaining bombs. So you'd see pop marks. But on the top of that ridge, there was that haha, Sienia Superba. The army had developed the environmental department in 94, I believe it was. And they started taking the seeds and growing them in their hot house. So the environmental group of the army, I love those guys. Because they're preserving the endangered species, not only here, but at all of the installations. Um, so CNS Superbo was one of them. All of those that was there in Makua have been burnt and extinct now in the wild. The only ones that's still existing is in a hot house or where they did outplanting. Problem with outplanting is that until it secures its it's uh, area that is planted, you don't know if they're gonna survive. So you can plant stuff and it could die because it wasn't meant for that location. Um, they're trying. Uh, let's see, the kuhuli, which is the, the snail. You got the ilapayo, you got the makua daisy, you got the uh, mauhauhele. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other endangered species there, and every time there's a fire from training, there were quite almost, there was over 200 fires in Makul over a 10 year period. And it would burn through the endangered species habitat, where they would have to report to Fish and Wildlife that they killed them, and they said, oh, okay, well, we're gonna end up doing an out planting, or we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. Uh, in exchange for those that we killed. So these are Hawaiians that don't have voice. They cannot go to the legislature and say that. Problem with Fish and Wildlife is that's a federal agency. These two guys are colluding to make it okay to kill endangered species, Hawaiian species, and make it okay. So a lot of the species that was in there are extinct. They don't, don't exist anymore. Um, Let's see, 
some of the things that are there, um, no, I, I, you got to come take a look after. Anyway, there's mo'o petroglyphs. There's uh, petroglyphs that look like men, uh, dogs. Uh, there's a, one that I've seen. Uh, it's on a flat kohaku in the middle of the Koyahi side. And it has uh, a petroglyph, just one, in the middle of it. And it is of a person in an aiha'a stance, moku moku. So it's the, the warrior stance that you would do for lua or something like that. But it, moku is also known as a lua training area. So the military jump on that and say, oh yeah, yeah, well, we train. I said, yeah, but you know what? The lua guys never leave the mess. You cannot see the upala that they were using or the stuff left behind. You guys got pilau all over. And in that one pohako, there's bullet holes in them. Coming from the ocean at Makoa, they had all of the houses, the people that lived there. And during one of the training exercises, they went ahead and put white crosses on the, on the roof. That, and they told all the residents, this was so they don't bomb your, your house. But they never tell the pilots, because when the pilots came in, oh, we thought that was the targets. So they blew them all up. They did amphibious landings from the ocean. And if you go to the graveyard, you can see bullet holes in the headstones not all of the, the headstones are damaged, but a lot of them. All of the, the rock walls that are parallel to the ocean, when they would do their amphibious landings, they would going, be going uphill, shooting. All of those things have bullet holes in them. So this is the kind of blind unawareness that they had and they continue to have, because they still want to go training. And we're still battling with them. Um, Ulumaika, they had, there was a, the basalt adz that was found there, uh, besides the petroglyphs, there were spring waters. There, I believe there were like 20 springs in Makua. Some of them were brackish, some of them were a little bit salty, but a lot of them was sweet water. But the community there, and I believe that, that there were about 800, maybe a thousand people living there one time. Now this is a closed community because you couldn't get there except walking around the coast, coming over from Kauai Hapai, Wailua side, or around Kaena. So one of the areas they called Laihao, and this is where they say the children of the Li'i were raised. And that's kind of where Yandra and I spent most of our time. And it was on the very Oceanside point of the Kamaka uh, Kuleana. Now one of the things the military has done is that all of the Kuleana property on their maps, they claim as fee to them. That they own all of the Kuleana properties in fee. Now, um, Ivanhoe Naivi was one of the Kuleana landowners, and he was kicked off the property. And what the military says, they were paid fair, everybody was paid fair market price during that time. I don't know, what does that mean? 100 bucks, 10 bucks? Uh, but some of them said they were moved out at gunpoint. No money, gunpoint. So, Ivanhoe Naivi was one of those that was forced out, and they said, we'll give you back your land six months after the war's over. Six months later, he's humbugging them so they didn't go back. No, cannot do that. In fact, the IRS went after him for not paying in taxes. They put him in jail for two years to keep him quiet. Now this is, again, this is my story from stories that I heard from others. Prove it right, prove it wrong. But this is the same kind of stories I heard out of Puerto Rico with the Navy going in and forcing people off their land, burning their houses, bulldozing their houses, and forcing it to allow them to have access and use of the land. Um, in 46, 
that's when the Hilo tidal wave happened. By then, the railroad was already on the coast, but the tidal wave wiped out the railroad and the railroad tracks here on the coast as well. One of the uh, Kupuna Japanese family that uh, had houses on Pokai, those houses was pushed across Farrington Highway. We never had that kind of story share that the tidal wave affected us. But if you go to Makua, you got the central uh, stream that goes out to uh, Muliwai, and you can see still that there's a huge concrete uh, pillar, and that's where the, the train track went over as it went down uh, to go around the island. Uh, let's see. Oh, Uncle Ivan Honaivi did get his land back, and it's a form of a grave at the uh, graveyard. So he's buried there. And if you go there, you can see a little Hawaiian flag or American flag on his, his grave, because he was also in the military. Uh, let's see, 1929, Executive Order 531 issued by the then governor of the territory of Hawaii. So what makes that interesting is that during the territory, the territorial governor was appointed by the President of the United States. So even though we said no, and the President said yes, Army said yes, government said yes, the governors would have to say yes. Um, and this is where that lease comes in, at least uh, what happened was uh, Steinbeck was one of the territorial governors, and the army wanted to claim 6,000 acres from Okua. And he says, well, we want it back for the use of our people. So if you can see that conflict uh, in the 40s where the federal government says, we want the land, and this guy is saying, no, no, we need it for our people, uh, they want something more assured. They want to make it so it's there. So they're claiming it in fee. They took all of the Kuliana property, claim it in fee, and they issued an executive order to make it so that they had control of it. So the back portion of Makua is what the military claims. The front part is leased by the state, DLNR. Now, in 59 during statehood is when uh, the government had five years to resolve all land ownership. And this also falls into Mauna Kea, all of the properties that the military have taken over on our coast, Schofield, uh, and even between Schofield and Kuhuku, they ended up getting uh, Oha to buy a strip of land to be the buffer between public lands, where Waimea Valley is, and their training area. And then the military has been buying property. So, Ni'ihau, they forced the Robinsons to sell because they had the IRS pressure them for unpaid taxes. So now, the military has an airstrip on the far end of Ni'ihau. They have the missile tracking area. They got the naval training where they're doing all of this uh, undersea searching for uh, the sounds. They're using sounds to search for uh, submarines and it's killing the, the dolphins, the whales, uh, and affecting our sea life. So although this is about Makua, as you can see, the tour of Waianae, the impacts that we have is broader than just that one spot. Mauna Kea is another example. You got Pohakuloa. They ended up buying property from uh, the Parker Ranch to make it so that they could get the roadway so they didn't have to deal with people like, like us in, uh, from Makua because we were a thorn in their side. They have lost every court case uh, that we've challenged them for the last, this is going on 15 years. But at one point, they're gonna wanna go back to train. And at one point, we may not be able to win in federal court. In fact, the first time we went to federal court, uh, we were afraid because we would be personally liable for any of the costs. We could lose our house, 
we could go to jail, we could do... I mean, that's the kind of pressure that communities are put under to battle the federal government. And this is what Pohakaloa is facing. This is what Mauna Kea is facing. Uh, Haleakala. We got all of these things, and military plays a huge role in how they dictate uh, our survival. Because they say, well, this is for jobs. I've had uncles say, boy, what the hell are you doing? These guys helped us survive. They gave us jobs. They made sure that we could feed our family. So we become slaves to this abuse, and it becomes okay. We become blind to the, the results of their activities, and it becomes okay. Not because we want it, but because we've accepted and turned our eye because we're so busy trying to survive. Makua has a whole bunch of cultural sites. When I first started out there, they said, ah, no more nothing. Look, it's all overgrown. Then there would be a fire. And then all of a sudden, all of these sites pops up. And we were able to get them to get their archaeologists out there to check it out and document it. And the heiau ukanipoa, which is the heiau on the far end, uh, when it burned, they said, well, it was only a, like an acre or two. When it burned, they found that it was more than an acre. Initially, it became five acres, and then it became 20, and the whole site across Bakua became connected from one side all the way to the other, and sites all over. And where there were ancient heiau had been bulldozed for trading sites, and this is all done without an EIS, without any type of consulting. Historic preservation did not play a role at all. When the fires happened that burnt up almost all of Makua, went over the ridge into the endangered species habitat and killed a lot of them, the heiau stones looked like emo rocks. That's how hot the fire was. And the constant burning, like I said, it was almost, it was over 200 fires that burnt over a 10 period, 10 year period. And these are all different sizes. The one that I remember that burnt over the ridge, uh, Marines were there training, they lobbed the mortar, went outside of the fire break road, caught on fire, come five o'clock, Brown, we gotta go. They pack up and they go home. We're watching from the road as the fire is building and burning and burning and burning, and then they bring a helicopter in. But they cannot see the water. And then they didn't have a dip pond at the time, so they couldn't get water, but seawater. The Kahuli snail, you cannot put salt on them. You're gonna kill them. So what they're doing, they're dumping salt water on the endangered species habitat. Again, fish and wildlife, wildlife after the fact, says you cannot do that. With the heiau bird, endangered species bird, they were able to, we got them to put in dip ponds and come up with a fire plan. But now more and more, every time there's a command change, they say, oh, we never make that deal. We never say that. That's why we took them to federal court. Because we'd have one general saying, we're gonna clean, clear up to the 12 foot depth, all the way 1200 meters into the valley, the whole valley. Next general come in, I never say that. You're not even allowed to go in there anymore. So within our agreements with Malamokua through courts, we were able to get them to grant us two times a month to go access into Makua. We do a makahiki once a year, opening and the close, uh, which is overnight. And, it, and this is another thing. Go to malamokua.org and you can go ahead and sign up for any of the accesses as well as uh, participate in Makaiki um, and get more information at the website. And I probably talked too much. I'll let you take a look and thumb through all of this. I just want to share my last story, which is about the Queen. And uh, the Wai'anae Coast has been used for military for a long, long time. Amphibious landings at Pokai Bay, Makua, uh, all of the cables that are coming through, all of the exposure from the military training and activity. But this is one of the things I got from, about the Queen, and this is about Jim 
Jim Bartell, who was the uh, caretaker for the, the palace. And he ended up interviewing one of the old, old uh, Hawaiian docents that was there. When she was a little girl, she was one of the little girls hanging around with the queen on the queen's birthday. And everybody would bring the queen gifts and this little girl was watching what was going on and seeing all of the pomp and circumstance around the queen's birthday. There's a fisherman, a master fisherman from Waikiki and his specialty was akupalo. And if you ever tried akupalo or ever got close to it, it's very um, strong. Uh, anyway, he made his best akupalo, wrapped it up, and took it and gave it to the queen. And of course, this little girl's on her side saying, oh, not so good. She didn't, I mean, anyway. So the queen thanks the fisherman and says, I'm going to eat all of this. Thank you very much. Fisherman leaves, the little girl says, Oh no, you can throw it away now. That stuff is bad, it stinks. And the, and the queen said, no, I'm gonna eat all of it. And this little girl said, but why? Nobody gonna know. And what the queen said, I will eat all of it because it was given to me with love and I will know. If our politicians and our leadership was of that same mind to do things that was pono, uh, even when people are not looking, and do the things that are uncomfortable, we wouldn't have to go through any of that stuff. But that being said, it is our responsibility to help train the next generation of leaders in the pono way, be connected to the spiritual land base. And like I was saying, for me, aina doesn't mean dirt. It means all living things, which includes all of us. So that's helped me understand that the military, the guys that are polluting, the guys that are doing all of this negative stuff, they might be opposition, but we're still family. And thank you very much. Yeah, we do community access yes. uh, twice a month. Okay. I think the next one's going to be on the 12th. Okay. But we, everybody got to register. So we got to, you got to submit the names. We got to submit it to the military. Well, some of our uh, extreme activists have been denied access. Uh, if we get people from foreign countries, like we had people coming in from Jeju and Korea, that they didn't want to go in. And so it depends on the level of uh, concern they might have. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, we we're very, uh, our goal is not to do battle with them. We want to be inside the gate. And the goal is to listen, to feel. It's a personal, experiential uh, opportunity for anybody that goes in. So it's a personal thing that you get connected and there's no barrier of the fence blocking us from that energy. Uh, I said, come on, what are you telling me? I can handle it. 
I've been persecuted before, but what is more important is when they figure it out, it's going to be inside them. And that's the bigger lesson. But my honor was to be confused as well because of you folks' dedication. We were the first families to be evicted from there. We were known as this is back in the day. And it was a cultural site to teach and train and all of that. And some of us were, we, we couldn't be down there all the time. But for you folks to take on that kuleana with your family and your life, um, I cannot give you enough aloha. Y and I, there are places where, um, you know, uh, toxic materials are, are stored, you know, by the U.S. Navy at Lua Lua Lei. There are places where, you know, um, illegal dumps occur, dumps of, of, of trash. And, and we think that this is a terrible thing because Y and I, as, as everyone know, knows, was once a major breadbasket of this island. A major ag ag agricultural and, um, and, and, and fishery um, for the entire island. So, you know, we're here to show support to the Makua, uh, you know, community, to the people in Waianae. Um, Kahea is very much opposed to militarization of our lands. Um, for us, um, the building of a military base, and especially, and especially the use of our lands for um, live fire, or even, or even just for target practice, or any other kind of military military use um, does a number of things. One is, one is very often it threatens the environment. Two, it certainly displaces Kanaka, who, who may have been able to live on these lands and farm it and use it productively. And we know that people have been evicted from Makua over the years, since the 1980s. Um, we are really, really happy that um, for the last 10 years they have not been using live ordnance on Makua. But really, you shouldn't have to tell the military, you shouldn't have to tell the, the Navy or the Marines or the Army that you, you, that you shouldn't do this. Um, these lands, the, the, the Aina in Hawaii is small and precious, and a number of people depend on these lands uh, for living. Um, and at one time, these lands used to supply everything that we needed. It is absolutely insane. It's insane for the military to say, well, we stopped you know, live farming, firing because, uh, because you talked to us, because you said so. They should never have done, done this in the first place. And we look forward to the day that the military will actually simply leave, um, not just Makua, but Schofield, Shafter, um, all those places, you know, that um, Lihu'e is the traditional name for Schofield. Um, and all of these places that really do um, belong to Kanaka Maoli. And when that day comes, um, then organizations like Kaihea will not have to exist. We're here to celebrate 10 years of non-live fire uh, practice at Makua Valley. And it's, you know, such a wonderful thing to celebrate because the Army said that without practicing at Makua, they would not be Army ready to go and fight the wars that they fight. Um, so fortunately, that is not a true statement because here we are 10 years later where they have not practiced live fire and they are actually going on the other side of the world and actually still having war activities. Today's event is really to honoring 10 years of peace in the valley. Makua Valley has been subject to live fire training, um, which has been a real threat to the community and also to the world. 
because we really think that training soldiers to kill others and training them in the land that supports and aloha is part of our constitution, it's kind of doesn't really fit. So there's a real issue there. Makua is this incredible valley that at one point was a real agricultural set settlement. Uh, there were springs, natural springs, um, all sorts of wonderful things there that could support a community. When the army came in uh, during World War II, the United States let them lease the land for a dollar a year and then basically said, you know, when all of the fighting is over, the land will revert back to the people. That never happened. And the people are still struggling to gain access to their valley, to revitalize the valley that has been absolutely decimated by live fire training. Several years ago, there was a, a fire that basically burnt out so much of the valley right across the road. I mean, it was really very heartbreaking to see that um, basically a foreign country could come into our land and destroy a very sacred valley, sacred to the people of this community and sacred to everybody on this island, actually, and, and all our islands, because every section of our land, every place where you step your feet is Hawaiian land. And we always have to remember that we are in somebody else's house. This is our aina. Aina o Hawaii. No nakanaka Hawaii. And that does not just mean for the Hawaiian people, but it means for the people of Hawaii. So for us, especially for our kupuna, this was a place of healing. This was a place of comfort and of care. So when the army came and chose to use it and convert it into a place of warfare, that really was anoe. Um, so I'm glad that they brought that to my awareness. And so I'm glad that they're bringing it to our current generation's awareness. Uh, especially to my babies and their babies, so that we can malama our aina. Well, I'm an honored guest of the community to celebrate the 10 years of peace in Makua Valley. However, historically, I share much more heart and soul of this whole area, because back in the 80s, we used to come here for a summer vacation. And many folks around the island, whether it was west side, east side, north shore, People would go holo holo. It was so ono because everybody had their favorite recipes and you know aunties and uncles and cousins and it was just you got to literally as children kind of grow up on the beach. And then when the military stopped that, that's when people decided that it wasn't right. And so there were there was I wanna see maybe 40, 50 people and supporters, however. There was so much malama in the group and the community organizers that helped us at that time. It was all about taking care of people, getting our message across, but taking care of ohana. So if you had kiki or you were breastfeeding, you weren't gonna go in the circle to get arrested because it may harm your family or disrupt the situation. So the individuals that were in that first eviction were about six of them and they got chosen by the group. And so I remember that I was a first aid person. So we'd have a band in case there was something that, you know, went astray. Um, and we had bail money, we had an attorney, you know, so that people, it was very organized, it was very planned. You know, we had some, we had a union organizer, we had Auntie Frenchie, we had um, Bernard, he was from Molokai, and um, he was a leper. So we had much aloha and Nothing too much happened out that except that maybe we planted a seed. So the next time around, when people came here for many different reasons, there were more people that got evicted. And the third time, there was over 300. So definitely, our seed got planted. And it's still going on today. So there's many ways to support. But first of all, before we preserve and support, we need to educate. 
a lot of our children that are in poverty here on this aina do not know their culture. They, um, they're afraid to learn their language. You know, I talk to people, oh, I want to learn my language. I said, it's in you. It's in your cells. Just start with the simple words you know and say it to your kiki every day. And the rest of it will come when it's time for you to get it. But we've been taught so much through a Western style and myself included, when I go to college, oh, I gotta have it right. You know, oh, I'm not doing this right. Let me check, make sure it's right. Whereas Pacific style of learning is very different. It has to get solidified in your cellular memory in order for it to be a living language. And that's what's missing today. So if we don't start doing something about it now, no one will be left to pass it on. And so you see a lot of that happening. And people, you know, there's two sides. Oh, you may not be doing it right. Well, we're going to learn. You know, people are going to learn. But the important thing is somebody's doing something pono so that the kiki, and when you see these folks learn their language, learn their culture, learn their history, it, their, their spirit just shines because they know who they are. And when you know who you are, you know where you can go. And you go with pride, regardless of your economic situation. Anuai, my name is Glenn Makakauli Ikila and I'm a Kupuka Aina lineal descendant of Wai and I. Uh, my parents also comes from Makua. I am a descendant of my Tupuna Wahine. Her name was Po'opua Kala, who, reside, uh, who resided in Makua uh, back in the 1800s. Um, our family lived in White and I for the last 2,000 years, and uh, we still reside here uh, right now at Nene'u and also in, uh, in uh, Makaha. Uh, in regards to Makua, uh, this was the land of creation for our family. Uh, the Kumulipo that most people uh, records as the creation chant um, actually came from Makua, according to our Tupuna. Um, Auntie or Mama Neil uh, shared with me about the, the uh, Pohaku of uh, Kula'ila'i where our first mother uh, Laila'i uh, dwelled. We also have uh, evidence of Makua being the uh, origin of our people uh, with the birth of Hua Nui Ikala'ila'i who is one of the earliest chiefs uh, born from in Hawaii. And we have legends of Moiteha and um, of Potai and Moete uh, coming here uh, from Tahiti. So uh, Makua has a lot of history. Um, the Wahipana of Makua is very important uh, to the creation chant because uh, not only Lai Lai, the first mother, uh, dwelled here, and Huanui, Huanui Ika Lai Lai, or Huanui of Lai Lai, also being born here in Ohikilolo. But all of the chiefs um, on the Big Island in Maui also, uh, what do you call it, comes from this uh, origin here. Uh, Makua was originally called Na Makua in the chants, which means parrots, not just Makua. Uh, the old name for uh, Na Makua was Kanihuna Motu. Kanihuna Motu means the, the island or the place of Kani. Uh, Kanihuna Moku, uh, was uh, the, the place for uh, Kani religion. Uh, this year, uh, we appeared at the IARF, the International Association of uh, Religious Freedom Congress in London to request or to ask for international support for our religious uh, beliefs. And uh, today, we're very proud that Kani Nui Kea uh, which comes from Makua, uh, is being recognized as the second inter, uh, indigenous religion in the world. So uh, right now we are uh, putting a, in place all of the uh, evidence that uh, Kumulipo comes from uh, Makua, uh, including Kao Makua, which is the eastern uh, point uh, for the Wainai Uka, or the Wainai Moku, to Wainai Kai, which is, we know as Wainai Coast. So Makua plays a big role in our religion of Kaninui Kea and also in our history of the Ali'is 
and of the creation chants. Uh, we have Ukani Po, Heihau, uh, which is the sound of Po or the groaning sound. We also have uh, Kadiana Cave, which is the womb of Papa, our Earth Mother with Kani, uh, the Sky Father. We have uh, Kalai o Kalaal, which is Kayana Point, uh, which also is the male figure, the phallic symbol, uh, with Kaniana, the Makua Cave, or Kaniana Cave being the female uh, symbol. And so in this area from Kaniana to Kaiana Point, or Kalaya Kalaal, uh, you have this energy of birth. That uh, reason why we believe that uh, Namakua was the birthing place. Uh, we shared with uh, the archaeologists about our uh, creation chants of uh, Ko'iahi, uh, where the sun beam hits into Kahanaiki, which is uh, the female uh, uh, feature of the Aina and how uh, the birthing of or creation of, uh, of our people uh, stems from Makua. Um, the sand dunes, there are a lot of Eevee here. Back in the 1990s, uh, we uh, stood as a family, uh, the Kupakaina family, in stopping the amphibious uh, landing the amphibious landed here in uh, Makua. And from there, uh, there were later lawsuits like from Malama Makua, which extended to the live fire. But um, all of this uh, information is uh, recorded in the newspapers, how the Waianae families stood together with our kupuna and sharing about the history, about this being the Garden of Eden for our uh, Hawaiian religion, Kane Nui Akea. We also have uh, the concept uh, Ka'a Nani Ao, uh, managing the beauty time, uh, which these features, natural features, are recorded uh, in the uh, Mo'olelo and also of uh, the uh, chants, the olis, uh, early uh, olis uh, that stem from Hiyaka traveling over here. Uh, we predate uh, Hiyaka and Pele's chants and uh, their arrival uh, as recorded that uh, we called Pele a Malihini Akua uh, because we were here. We were uh, the fern people. Kupu Kupu is, uh, is a fern and we are the Kupu Ka'aida, uh, the people that sprouted from the land. Uh, we are uh, working together now in the protection of uh, Makua and uh, we're uh, requesting that all training stops in Makua because this is the land of creation for our Hawaiian religion, Kaninuekea, and also for our people of Makua, Waianae, and all of Hawaii. Mahalo for letting me share. Aloha. I made a share of Manao of uh, Makua and uh, why I'm here. <clears throat> this place is a very significant place for me because as a child, I used to come over here and spend time with my aunt. My aunt used to live here. They used to have a village over here at one time. This is way before this valley has been developed or been disturbed. The people that live on this Aina over here, you know, live off the land, they live off the ocean. And uh, their lifestyle was very uh, unique for them and uh, as well as for me. And you know, as a child, I, uh, my mother used to bring me here to uh, spend time on Ohana and uh, get to play with my cousins and, you know, and, and live down here for a while. You know, and to me, I, I'd better spend time on the beach and do a lot of swimming and activities that uh, involve the land. The Aina was uh, something that we respect, it was something that we understood, and uh, to me, it's, uh, it's the giver of life. My involvement uh, with this valley over here, yeah, uh, after the military took over, and they uh, literally destroyed the valley, you know, by all this bombing and such, that I, I knew nothing about, yeah? You know, why would people destroy something that's so beautiful? 
and uh, I didn't understand that as, as a kid. Today I'm dealing with it now because I, I know it's significant for me and the lifestyle that I live and uh, and how much of the, of the land, you know, that I can understand is that, you know, we're here to malama the aina, not destroy the aina, you know. I thank God, you know, that uh, somehow I, I found my way back here and I raised my three sons on this beach over here. And at that time I wasn't uh, homeless, I was houseless. And uh, I needed a home and this place uh, kind of uh, draw me to, to come here at this time. And I came down here because I'm a fisherman. I love to fish, I love to live off the ocean. And I wanted to, to teach my children, you know, about this place. Away from the, the city, you know, away from the, the indoctrination of the Western culture, you know, because there's nobody was teaching us about being Hawaiian. So we had to teach our children to be Hawaiian. Because in order for us to teach, we need to live in. And that's what I was trying to do with, with my family. And, um, and I try to pass it on to other families and people that I, I get in touch with. I came here and, and for many years, I live off the beach. I went through a couple of hurricanes over here. It still didn't force me to leave the area, but I left and I did come back and everything else because somehow I felt that uh, this place needed me and you know and I need to do something about it you know so I came for the cleanup of Makua Valley because I respect the valley I respect you know the the ancient ways and uh, the the land is a gift of life you know it's not a land where we need to destroy it but we need to take care of it. And hopefully we can pass that on to our children and their children and those that are yet not born. It's important to us because the right to be a native Hawaiian is important to be as a right to be equal. And I thank God that uh, people are starting to understand our purpose and uh, our way of life. And, and hopefully we can bring the respect back you know, to the land and make people can enjoy it. Especially the kids today. They are very desperate to ignoring their culture. They are very desperate to knowing their, their, their lifestyle and they're very desperate to knowing their language. And to do that is to understand what it is to be Hawaiian. You know, I thank God for that and I thank, you know, the reason why I'm here and um, hopefully that it will continue on, you know, for many, many more years after that I'm gone. But that's my manau on this place. And, you know, and to me, there was a lot of stories about this place when I was a kid. And I remember before the road was built, we used to come up to the top of the cave. And we, that's, all, that's as far as the car could go. And we had to walk the rest of the way in. When we came over here to this village here, the beach, as I can remember, you know, was was all sandstones. I mean, we didn't have sand, it was just sandstones. There was all the way down this whole beach. Somehow the Corps of Engineer, the Army of Corps of Engineers came and they, they removed all these sandstones, you know? And then I haven't seen it for many years. You know, and finally I recognize the these sandstones that are using it for the for the sidewalks in Waikiki. And I remember and I said to myself, gee, you know, those are the sandstones that belong here. You know, and, and the state removed it and everything else and they're using it down Waikiki. You know, so it, it, to me, we used to slide on it, we used to play on it, you know, and uh, you know, and they used to have a pond over here. And my kupuna used to tell me that uh, when the water is green, they say that we're not supposed to go in there and play. We never understood why, but later on I found out that there is a myth pertaining to that pond. 
They were talking about the mole that live in the pond. And uh, to me, I, I couldn't understand what the mole would meant, you know, and talking about a lizard. But the story went back as far as, uh, as this place, the cave itself, Kianahana, you know, and the way it, uh, it was told to me is that, you know, two people are madly in love. And because they're so close in families, and the families they didn't want them to, uh, you know, uh, to be together. So I think they cast a spell on them, you know, and one became a shark. Yeah, and the animal became a lizard, or called a mole, yeah. So in the daytime, the woman would change into the mole, yeah, and she would live in the pond. Then when she became in human form at night, the man turned into the manu, yeah, he was a shark, and he lived in the ocean, yeah. So the story was very interesting. It's scary, but I couldn't understand it. But yet today, you know, because their love was so strong that uh, no matter what circumstances that they encountered, they still managed to to have that love, you know. You know, so when it was shared to me, I respected what I was told, and you know, and I went on in life, you know. What I mean, you know, not saying a word about it, yeah. But I'm glad that. But I get to share my now and some of these things and you know hopefully that uh, some of my stories will inspire others to come out you know and, and share what they what they know about this place as far as when I was a kid I enjoyed it then I enjoyed it now and I will enjoy, enjoy it forever so anyway I I'm grateful today that we are celebrating 10 years uh, of clean up and, and, and restoring and educating people that come to Makua, you know, to learn more about this place because there's there's so much uh, uh, that Makua offers to those that have needs, people that uh, are without, that the valley makes you feel, you know, very positive about yourself, you know, and, uh, and I think to me, you know, it was a place that, uh, a refuge that, uh, you know, that we can come and, and, and understand, you know, about ourselves. So that way, when we lived through the day, we know what we are. And, uh, and I thank God for that, yeah. The changes you see now with the roads and, you know, the military coming in, you know. And, and to me, it disturbs the place because you know, more and more the deterioration of the valley. You know, history has been lost every time that the valley has been bombed. And every time when I used to be here as a kid, this whole place would be on fire. You know, and I used to hurt inside, you know, because I felt like I was dying. I felt like uh, we've been destroyed, you know. And, and there's a lot of things that uh, we can learn about the land, you know what I mean, that, uh, that we might not uncover today because of the destruction that the bombs uh, were, were doing. People that come here doesn't understand the true nature and the form, you know, and the different elements that connects us to this land. And uh, we take pride in, 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 uh, in taking care of the things that uh, are very useful, useful to us, you know, because the valley provides sustenance, provides food, it provides the vibe that comes down from the from the valley. You know, and today I try to stress that with my Mopunas, you know, with my children also, and also my Ohana. Yeah, so that they too can understand that uh, it's vital for them also too. Yeah. But if we work together and we malama, the aina and, and the kai. You know what I mean? Then all these things that we need shall be provided for us. And uh, not just for us, but for everybody in the world. And we're trying to be an example for the rest of the world. And uh, we're not trying to dictate anything to them or say what's, what's better. We know what's good for us. And that's, and that's the important thing, you know, that, that we can share and uh, we can understand 
and we can live the way we want to live. Thank you very much. Mahalo to all. I'm here today to help Malama Makua celebrate 10 years without live fire training at Makua. Uh, it's really an incredible accomplishment. It's not something that we uh, even thought was possible when we started on this journey in the middle 90s. I came to Earth Justice from California in 1995. I got off the plane and one of my first assignments was to meet with a group of citizens on the Waianae Coast who were concerned about the effects of live fire training at Makua. They wanted to know what the live fire training was doing uh, to children who were playing down at the ocean, what, what it was doing to the fish and the limu that they gathered from the sea, what it was doing to the sacred sites, what it was doing to the endangered species uh, on the mountains that ring Makua, Koyahi, and Kahanaiki. They wanted answers from the Army and they'd been asking for years, and the Army had refused to give the community information about what the effects of their training might be and what the alternatives to that training might be. Uh, why train at Makua, such a sacred place, a place in such close proximity to families, uh, with so many sacred sites, with so many endangered species? We got them to agree that every time they do a live fire training exercise, from now until when they leave Makua forever, there will be civilians on hand to observe those exercises and to make sure the Army very carefully follows all the rules and regulations that are put in place to protect the sacred sites and to protect the endangered species and to protect the people of Waianae. So while it was a difficult decision for Earth Justice and Malama Makua to agree to any live fire training at Makua, we decided that in the interest, the long-term interest of the valley, the long-term interest of the people, it was better to get the information about the impacts and the alternatives, and it was better to get these uh, long-term agreements from the Army about protection of cultural sites, about removal of unexploded ordnance, about protection of the community, and also detailed studies about the effects of contaminants from Makua and whether they were poisoning the food in the ocean that people would gather. Uh, that agreement was entered on October 4th of 2001. In the following three years, the Army conducted about 27 live fire exercises, which was radically fewer exercises than they used to do. They used to train something like 200 days out of the year. And then, in 2004, they came to the end of the three-year period for finishing the environmental impact statement, but because they had prioritized other things, they weren't done yet. Uh, the agreement, however, provided that if the environmental impact statement were not completed on time, the Army could not do any live fire training until that study was completed. And here we are now in September of 2014. It's been over 10 years since the last shot was fired in Makua in June of 2004, and still the environmental impact statement is not finished. So while we are disappointed not to have the information, about the effects of military training at Makua, we are happy that the, that the valley has been at peace. And not only has the valley been at peace, but just the, the, the course of events has demonstrated in a very tangible and undeniable way that while the army may like to train at Makua, it is not necessary for national security because in the many years since 2004, the army has deployed to combat over and over and over again They've been fully trained, fully certified, and none of those soldiers has fired a shot at Makua. So today we celebrate 10 years of peace. We look forward to a future where, where peace will continue in Makua, where the last shot will have been fired in 2004, and this valley can be returned to culturally appropriate use, can be returned to the people of Hawaii. Today also we exercised our access rights under the court uh, order and the settlement agreement to bring members of the community into the valley to re-establish the life of the land, to practice our culture, and to bring life back to this valley that has been abused for so long by military training. So while we don't know exactly what the future will bring, we know that the efforts that we made so far have moved Maku in a good direction, and we're hopeful for the future. Aloha, my name is Ronald Kaili Kolani Malohio Keau Lopes, son of Wilfred Po'onui Lopes, and Lena Ala Lopes, Moses Lopes. And uh, we, I was born and raised in Nanakuli, but I uh, spent many, many uh, days out here at Makua, as every summer we'd come and uh, cut the grass at the graveyard. And we also came out here and seeing military coming across the sand 
with tanks, you know, amphibious vehicles that just rolled right through the bushes, over the roads, there's no roads, and straight up into the mountains and just had their war games. Uh, I'm just grateful for Malama Makua that held on to the fight for this long, you know, and it's remarkable that there hasn't been any uh, live ammunition or live um, ordnance being dropped here in Makua. Slowly but surely, that can be something of the past. Bombs don't need to be exploded anymore on the land. Anywhere, it should be obsolete. With that being said, I am also a veteran of the Afghanistan war. And bombs doesn't bring nothing but destruction. I realize that, I've experienced it. And I come, I've come full circle to protect and defend and malama the Aina because someone has to go live there. The youth are going to inherit our Aina. They're going to inherit in the, in, this, in the condition that it's in. Um, and you know, I, I used to tell the seventh graders at Wainai Inter that we'd have a great time in the garden in Aipohaku, in the workshop. Um, but there was also a very serious side of it, you know, and that side was that the youth are going to inherit the earth. And the earth, including our aina here in Hawaii, here in Makua, in Makua Valley, has been degraded, you know, very degraded. And um, that can be very depressing and very sad to hear. And I would tell our youth that, you know, there are millions of people around the world working to make, to restore, to rebuild, to bring back the momona back to our aina, you know. It was once very easy, 40 or 50 years ago, to, to subsist, you jump in the water with your spear, your tro net, your lay net, you know, and you catch fish. Now, it's not so easy. You know, the land, there was water, there were still streams. Um, all of our natural resources are being, have been, are being used up and have been degraded. And we, we have to band together to restore. It really is a time of restoration, you know, it's like we've had a couple of, uh, you know, maybe 200 years of take, 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 and there's not so much left. And now it's the time of rebuild and restore. And this is not just something here in Makua, but this is something all through our islands, and I believe all through the world, actually. And so for you to know that they live in challenging times, they're going to inherit, inherit a very dangerous world, a very dangerous aina in many ways because of the contamination. But to know that there is hope, and that they can become part of this force, you know, to restore. So cultural access, this was one of the, um, in, in, in the settlement that Malama Makua uh, worked out with the army in October of, 9th, uh, October of 2001, cultural access was one of the key pieces because we realized that as long as Makua Valley is out of sight and out of mind, people don't know what's going on, then all they know is that, oh, it's a training range and it's contaminated and it's full of duds and exploded things and it's been burnt, you know, hundreds of times and it's a wasteland and it's useless, like it's dead aina. But when people come and they see and they touch and they're touched by this aina, they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's alive. And she's coming back and she's healing with or without us you know it's like they know that so cultural access um, I mean it, it means many things but I think the simplest way to explain it is it's like you visiting family so I always tell people bring water bring food bring it when we go this is not one rush kind of thing we're not walking all over trying to get somewhere fast and come back visiting, you're visiting with the people that are on your access with you. Um, it's a time to make connections. It's a time to, to touch and feel the Aina of Makua. This community to me is really a, an example of a community that has struggled for decades and has hung together because they know what's sacred, they know what's important, and they're going to fight for it and I'm going to be right there with them. You know, it's the coming together, it's the collaboration, it's the hui pu. So when the Kanaka give the kahea, 
You hear the kahea, it speaks to you, to your na'au, heleaku. And so those who come are the ones that will be blessed. Malama, Lokahi, and Pono. This is, this is the three uh, unities that I believe in. Um, if everyone can seek out what this means, you can find the purpose of what our people is. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you.